Welcome to Living Free in Tennessee, where we talk about building the life in you choose on your terms. Today is Monday, January 15th, 2024. This is episode 848, I think, of Living Free in Tennessee. And it's a Monday show, so we kind of get a Just Nicole show with our usual segments. And who we did it get cold and snow or what? We've been we've been having kind of fun shooting some videos and putting them out today of just the homestead life when an unexpected snowstorm, well, expected snowstorm comes, but we don't get these every year like this. In fact, this one is bigger than most. Oh, and um, let's see, Tigger has joined the podcast too, in case you didn't hear him walk up to my microphone and take a big old meow. But we've been having fun with that. And I want to say something before we jump into the show. I get down on Duluth because their jeans quality, their fabric quality of their jeans has gone way downhill over the years. But these overall, man, online, people were complaining because they, they run large, right? So you buy your size and you end up like billowing in the wind. But these things are the bomb because I've got a base layer. I've got my jeans and what I usually wear every day. And I wore my one size up jeans from what I need just so that my long underwear had plenty of room and it wouldn't be like super tight. And then those can pull up over all of it, which means when I go outside in the snow with the dogs, I got these overalls and the fabrics actually, it's, I mean, it's not waterproof, but it's water resistant. So that really, really, really helps. So you should check those out. They're the women's overalls. They're like the full length ones at Duluth. I got them on sale over Christmas and I was like, well, I've been kind of wanting overalls because I want to stage them so I can jump into them in my PJs in the middle of the night when I need to go do homesteading stuff unexpectedly. And they're really turning out to be a, a boon here. It's not quite cold enough for me to feel like putting on my padded ski suit, even though it is 15 degrees outside right now. Like when I'm out there moving out around, these are fine with this out. It's like I'm perfectly warm. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, today we're going to talk about addressing the things that keep you from doing what you love, the things that keep you from being with whom you love, the things that keep you from being who you are, and from building the life you choose, which is what we're all about here at Living Free in Tennessee. And it's all about ejecting the garbage from our lives. We will also discuss some important tax code changes. Matthew Sersley from Agris Tax Advice sent me a segment in today that I was going to play Friday, and then we had all of the internet problems and the power outages in the middle of that show. So I decided to wait till today when we, because we're, we're doing an experiment today by running a segment live. So we'll see how that goes. And then we'll do our usual Monday segments. So if you're on the live stream and want to get a question in or want to hear about something, Put the first word or two in all caps, I'll mark it and try to address it later in the show. If we go super long, I may end the podcast and then stay on. We'll just see how that goes. There's also a lot to do. Mark Sisk says that we are 25 degrees warmer than he is right now. Dude, I don't want to live where my face hurts. Like This is enough. This is perfect. I took the dogs for a lovely walk today. And I got some really fun video of them frolicking in the snow. Like Chestnut hates being cold. And she spent most of the day in the house, like with her little feet and her belly towards the wood stove on her side. But the minute she gets outside with another dog, it's like, it's like a three-year-old in the snow, like having a great time. And then she comes back and lays on her side as close to the wood stove as she can get. My cats have cabin fever. So you're probably going to see them enter the show because also my door to the house is open so that heat can come in here. And that's how that works with wood heat, right? So usually I can close the door, but it'll get too cold in here if I do that. So we're not going to do that. We like to be warm. That's right. Okay, our featured event of today's show is the Living Free in Tennessee Spring Workshop. We've got sessions from folks who are going to come. And I put out last week that if you wanted to, to uh, put your hat in to be one of four speakers who I'm adding this year from our network, $100 off your ticket, pitch me a session, and we'll see which four make it. I did that. I put a video out Sunday to explain why I did that. I did that because Jack did that one year, and it was the difference between me going to his workshop and not going to his workshop that I was presenting. And that discount made a huge difference for me. And so I'm hoping to pay that forward. I'll probably do that for a certain number of slots moving forward as much as possible. We'll see. It kind of depends on 
how things are on the next the next couple of workshops. But I've had some really cool pitches. One, the person wasn't sure they could deliver on it, so they pulled out. But we were we were looking at maybe getting some demonstrations of heavy equipment at the workshop, which would have been really fun. Um, and I've got you know stuff from managing tragedy, like putting your life back together after tragedy, to rainwater collection ideas, to soap making, fire starting, bread making, preserving food, putting together a homestead when you haven't been around it for a while, like all sorts of cool suggestions have come in. So we'll be rolling out the final agenda all week long so you can see what's going to be at the workshop and tickets go on sale January 20th at 9 a.m. at livingfreeintennessee.com or you can also go to the link in the show notes and it's funny because I'm looking at my show notes and the link is not there, but I know I pasted it into the YouTube description. So apparently I didn't put it in my master notes, but I did put it in the YouTube. Uh, Angie loves my background. Thank you. Uh, it's funny because my office and my house are still in a little bit of chaos. I have painted my background black. I'm, I have a sign. Actually, I'll show you the sign. For those of you on the video, this is... Uh, Oops, it doesn't usually come apart like this, but I have a sign with my logo on it that Ken Esch and Carmel gave me when we got to episode 500, and this is going to hang back there. But you see, if I hang it like straight back there, we have a bit of an issue, right? Like you can light behind it, but what I got, I've actually got a light box on the way or a shadow box that'll arrive this week, and I'm going to put it in the shadow box. And then I'm going, and then I'm going to, uh, <laughs> this is going to be, that's going to sound really interesting on the audio podcast. Anyway, I'm going to put it in the shadow box and then I'm going to have, I have led lights to put that are battery operated to put in the shadow box so that it can light behind it and have a different color background than my black wall. And then we'll have the, the logo up in the studio, but in order to get this to happen, things had to move out of the studio. And so I've still got like, staging area in my living room and I'm painting the rest of my walls while I'm in chaos here. But with the freeze coming, I did not do any inside work when I could do outside work. So now this week when we're going to be inside more, I'll be going wall by wall by wall and finishing the painting and getting my studio all put back together. So it's like before every show, I'm like, oh, I got to put the lights back up and I got to put the computer back up. And right over here to my left is the bookshelf where it's not supposed to be. And you can kind of you can kind of see the corner of my printer right there. So it's, it's a little chaotic, but I am, I'm loving having fun getting this background going and the lighting. And I've learned a lot about, I've spent so many hours watching YouTubes about how to light yourself. I still need some blackout curtains so we don't get the glasses get glare, but I've pretty much solved the glasses glare problem. And William says he can see the link in the YouTube. Great, 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 great. Beth Emily says, I love the snow. <laughs> you know, I don't love snow unless I'm skiing in it or sledding in it. And, you know, like the, the hassle of dealing with the snow on the homestead when you're not like really set up for that on the, on the regular is a problem. Like we're checking water every few hours in places where we don't have heated waters and we do that by choice. But like that part of the snow, I don't love, but there's always that like magical thing about, being a kid and it snowed and school got canceled and you just played all day long. That's still there. And there will be, there's video proof that I did sled down the hill in a concrete mixing tray today. It was not as fast as the runner sleds though. Just throwing that out there. Okay. Next up, I want to thank our two sponsors of today's show. And the first one is Agorist Tax Advice. Matthew Sersley at Agorist Tax Advice has dedicated his life his focus, his passion to helping you find the best way to structure your businesses and yourself and track and take advantage of the legal loopholes that exist. I'm not even sure you should call them loophole, loopholes, but there we, are, there we go. That's what layman, uh, layman people <laughs> call it. Anyway, he helps you figure out what tax write-offs you can track, helps you properly document them, understand any risks associated with that so that you keep more of your money. And there's been a change in the tax code that affects anybody who has a business. And he sent me a segment in last week to play for you all. And I was going to play it on Friday. And I've never done this before. So we're going to play a video 
So when this video starts, you won't see anything moving on the screen because I just put a stock image in front of it. This is Matthew himself explaining that. I need you in the comments to just tell me you can hear the audio because if you can't, we'll try it a different way. But here we go. I'm throwing it in there now. This is Matthew Sersley and I am the Agorist Tax Advisor. There is a major new financial regulation that went into effect in 2024. It is part of an anti-money laundering scheme that's not going to do any good, but we are still going to have to do some paperwork. Every single uh, LLC, corporation, LP, LLP, basically any business with an entity uh, is going to have to file a beneficial ownership information report this year. If you had a company before 2024, you've got a year to file this. If you create the company in 2024, you currently have 90 days to file this. And the current regulation says in 2025 or later, you will have 30 days to file this. It is a free form. It is a one-time filing unless you need to amend it because maybe ownership changes or something. Uh, it applies. Beneficial owners are people who have 25% or more ownership in a company. It also applies to senior officers of a company like a CEO, CFO, COO, or general counsel, and anyone who performs a similar function to any of these offices. It also applies to anyone who has a right to appoint or remove any senior officer. Finally, it includes any important decision makers for the company, and, uh, well, they haven't really defined that, so really helpful. Uh, failure to file this can result in a $500 civil fine per day. Now, many early reports of this said that that fine maxed out at $10,000. That is not the way I currently read the law. Instead, uh, if there is willful failure to file or fraud, they can criminally charge you and seek up to two years of prison time and a criminal fine that does cap out at $10,000. But as I read this law, that $500 per day fine has no cap, and that is per filing you should do. So if you have four different companies you are a beneficial owner of, then you have to, you can get a $2,000 per day fine as I read this law. Uh, this filing is really annoying because you're gonna put in the same information like four times in it. It's, it's just kind of stupid, but there is no reason not to do this. If you have an entity, even if you're not using it, this applies to inactive entities um, that have been, unless you're older than 2020 and haven't done anything with it in like a year or two. Um, so if you had a company that you started and didn't do anything with it, you may still need to file this. There is no reason not to file this now. Even if you have a year to do it, get it filed. Um, this is going to be something that's going to burn a lot of people. And it's not fair that it's going to do that because a lot of people aren't going to hear about it. But I wanted to make sure that the listeners of this podcast heard about it. So please um, make sure to protect yourself and file this. Now, if you want to get uh, additional advice from me, uh, you can reach out to me at agoristtaxadvice.com slash TSP or agoristtaxadvice.com slash LFTN that will uh, that you download a free report. It will also add you to my mail list, and from there you can contact me to ask questions about this or any other tax advice you have. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and make sure that you get this filed because it's going to screw a lot of people over who don't know about this. I'm going to talk quietly while you turn your volumes back down. I, okay, so what I've learned is that next time I'm going to audio produce this so it's a little bit louder. Uh, on the recording because I had that turned up as, as loud as it would go. And somebody asked me to summarize it. So Matthew Sersley is pointing out a new filing that's required at the federal level. That's an anti-money laundering filing. It's free to file. There's no reason not to do it. It's not fun paperwork because you have to put the same information in multiple times, but every entity that exists has to file. So you can learn more about it at agristaxadvice.com forward slash LFTN. If you sign up for his email, it explains a lot about it, but he wants to point it out because there is a $500 per day per entity fee plus possible criminal implications for not doing it. And if you have an entity you haven't used in a while, you still have to file for it. Okay. So, and there's some parameters around that, but 
definitely check that out. You want to make sure that you don't, you know, end up in club fed for not doing paperwork of all things. And I, I love that of Matthew that he wants to help people make sure they don't end up on the wrong side of things. Anyway, our second sponsor of today is the perfect one for a cold morning. And I had a cold morning this morning in the snow, started out all bundled up, making sure that water was not frozen for animals or replacing water that was frozen for animals. Hollerroast.com has awesome freshly roasted coffee to order that I will keep pumping out this week, even though the mailman won't be here today. He should be here tomorrow. Uh, anyway, it's awesome coffee that I roast in my roasting shack right out that door. As long as we have power, you can find out more at hollerroast.com. With that, it's also time to go over our live stream schedule, which starts right now, right here, 2 p.m. Mondays, we do this. But tomorrow, Tuesday Live at 12.30 p.m., I'll be live with John Willis, of course, who I'm always live with, and Tag from Life Done Free. So come on out and get any questions in you want to hear about. And then, of course, Wednesday, we have a 2 p.m. interview. My interview canceled after the Monday Mail went out saying who it was. And we've rescheduled her, but uh, I need to fill that spot. So I put a post out on Facebook. And if you want to be interviewed on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central, Put your name in on the comments, on the post, on the Facebook page. That's the only place where it is at this point. And we'll see who we end up on the show. Now, I have a backlog of people to schedule with interviews and interview forms in, but I did not feel like just adding somebody without the proper promotion. I like to get the mention of who it's going to be in the Monday Mail and have the marketing so they, they also get traction, right? So that's why we didn't just plug somebody else in from that list. But if you're on that list and you're like, why don't we just do my interview? Let me know. Let me know. We'll see. We'll see who we have. I might even do something kooky and do a roundtable discussion. And then Friday, 930 in the morning with the Tactical Redneck, we're going to do Homestead Happenings, which should be fairly entertaining this week because we have all the snow stories and we already have one about the livestock guardian dogs. Next segment is Tales from the Prepper Pantry. This is where we talk about using what you store and storing what you use. And we are in the middle of Pantry Challenge January, which is also dry January. Those things go together really well, by the way. Friday, Don Gorham from Gorham Homestead came out so that we could put our heads together on doing some cooking videos. We're looking at going nose to tail on animals. And just talking about how we cook different things, cooking things we've never cooked before and seeing how it goes. But we'll be doing that at Homegrown Cooking. And we needed to sit down in person because I just do better in person planning things like that. And so does she. And she brought me a bunch of her raw cream from her cows. And she brought me milk to make cheese with, which is super cool because the one thing I was going to end up kind of running out of this this week or this month was heavy cream because I only get a little bit on my milk subscription. And then the rest is basically skim milk after I, I separate those two things, which is sad because I like heavy cream in my coffee. But I was like, you know, I can do it for a month and I have freeze dried milk that I can put back together less, um, less, you know, like with less water so that it's stronger. And then that, that does pretty well in coffee. Like that's what I do when I'm on the road. Actually wondering something guys who are watching the video is, is there like a light blinky thing going on? I'm wondering if my power is being weird, but on my background, just let me know. Let me know in the comments. So I'm going to make cheese with, she brought me three gallons of milk to make cheese with. So I'll either do like a real, an unaged cheddar that I can use for, you know, taco salad or cream cheese, or I might do a farmer's cheese and press it out. I haven't decided what kind of cheese we're going to do. I might do a couple different kinds of cheeses, but one of my weak spots in the pantry is cheese and dairy because I don't have a dairy. And then she also brought me butter. So we're good in the butter department, but also onions. Onions are a weak spot. And I think this summer I will be more purposeful about cultivating the onions. Like I just, I planted a lot of onions, but they didn't do that great last year. So I'm hoping the soil, which was sort of our first time on that patch last year will be happier this year. And assuming that it is, we can have, we ha we'll have better growth, but also 
I need to pay attention to weeding better this year. And if that doesn't work, then I may source onions from another farmer who does better than I do and dry them. Uh, I usually do cold storage in my prepper pantry, 55 to 110 pounds of onions that I source locally. But this year I didn't do it because of the ripped up, the, you know, the ripped up living room and all of that. So I have lots of garlic. I do not have lots of onions and I really like onions. So that's just a good good lesson for me to have. I'm wondering, is it cheating if I resupply on my usual basis because I do it digitally and then don't use the stuff that arrives? What do you guys think? My fear is if I don't re like reorder on the schedule, I always reorder. I'm going to forget to reorder those things and that's going to bite me in about three months. But I don't know. Let me know your thoughts on that. And then uh, I have been taking a deep dive into my black upright deep freezer to use all because that's sort of where I end up whenever we do the freezer audits that freezer ends up with all the things that need to be eaten first and I'm finding amazing things in there first <laughs> I'm finding some amazing things in there but it's the odds and ends and those are the things I tend to put off cooking I have a lot of sheep testicles in there and I might actually do a lamb fry video and try them I've never tried them I don't typically like organ meats but you know, we could try it one time and see what happens. And livers went to Nighthawk. And then I discovered that that freezer was 30 to 40% bones for bone broth that I have not made because bone broth stores in frozen bones in less space than it does in bone broth. So having also approximately 68 jars of canned bone broth to go through which is a lot. And then that many bones, I have started the process of having bone broth every day. And we're taking out just a like a, a crock pot's worth or a, a Dutch oven's worth and putting it on the stove or wood stove if it's hot enough or my stove stove on low every day this week. Well, you know, we won't do it every day this week, but every day this week that we don't have bone broth ready to, to drink. And then we're having morning break and afternoon break with a little hot cup of bone broth, which I think is good for you, but it's also really great when it's cold outside. It warms you up and it staves off the munchies and all of those other things. Plus it's got really good collagen in it and other nutrients. So, so I'm going to cycle through that as well as I can without canning any of the bone broth I make from the bones in the freezer. And then hopefully I don't, I don't get, you know, like, that much more space in my freezer ever again taken up by bones. And the issue was I kept saving them and not it's, it's the fall. It's the same. It's like fall is still biting. It's still biting me because I, I didn't have as much domestic time as I usually have in the fall. AJ says he doesn't think it's cheating. If you use, if you don't use it during the challenge, what says I have Amagon sound subscriptions to stuff that I review quarterly. Yeah. Right. Mine are not Amazon subscriptions, but it is a, a cycle of things that, that come in. And it's, if you take my power pantry webinar, it's, it's related to going from long-term storage to short-term storage to order it. And that order it list gets ordered once a month. So I was thinking I'll just order the things that I order once a month from wherever they're ordered from. And then the things that I have to actually go in the store to get, I will just go in the store after I, I don't have time to go to the store this month anyway. I have a tendency, the things I have to buy in person, I well, have to, the things that make the most sense to buy in person, I have a tendency to do that quarterly anyway. So that's just not a big deal. And I haven't stepped foot in a grocery store. So there is that. My pantry meals this week looked, uh, <laughs> it's like my new love, the Romertopf is in my life. I've done a lot of Romertopf cooking and that's because it cooks crock pot like things faster than the crock pot. And the mouth feels a little bit better. So I love that. But I did a holler stew where I took the odds and ends of all the stews from the week before and put it into one pot. And we ate that. I took, because I'm going through the odds and ends in the freezer, I took out two venison loins that were packaged in one package that Mama Sauce processed the year, the year of the shin deer. Deer shin deer. 
And she had not taken the silver skin off. So I had put off cooking those because I knew I was going to have to let them defrost, take the silver skin off. It's like that extra step. That's why we take the silver skin off before we freeze usually. And I did a little live stream when I was getting one of those loins ready to go in the Romer top. And I took the silver skin off and showed you how I do that. I ended up cooking both loins in the Romer top on two different days. And surprise not surprisingly the redneck can go through most of it and it was not the tenderloin it was like the loin it was a big it was a big robust deer that that had been processed so we did that i did the creamy rabbit romer top where i had a whole rabbit that was butchered funny and i put it in the romer top and i had looked up a res recipe where you put cream cheese in it with it and that was super awesome and then we did taco salad. And all I can say is thank goodness for cabbage because cabbage lasts really well in the fridge. I had a cabbage in my fridge that I got the last weekend of December. I have half a cabbage left right now just from cutting it up and using it instead of salad and then pairing it with wild greens I find outside or stuff I'm growing outside, which right now it's looking pretty. We've got about, I'm just looking at how many inches of snow we have. We've got about six inches of snow now, maybe seven on top of everything. The most I've ever seen accumulate here is eight, eight to 10 one year. And that was a great year. We had so much fun in that snow, but um, it's the kind of snow you like to ski in, by the way. So it's like, it's like a light fluffy snow, not a heavy wet snow. So anyway, that's what, that's what I did all week. So literally I was just, cooking with the Romer top, cleaning the Romer top, cooking with it the next day, almost all week long, except for taco salad day. And taco salad day is, has been what I do in between. I didn't let stuff defrost and I don't feel like cooking from frozen. Oh, I did a tough old rooster too. So the, the American breast chickens are, I like them better, but the ones I let get a little bit too old are a little tougher and they're, they're better low and slow. I did that in the Romer top. It was still a little bit too tough. So I might try it in the rotisserie next time, or I might let it go longer in the Romer tops next time. But tactical and I were happy to eat it. And then I made bone broth out of the bone. And it's just the flavor of those birds is amazing. It's amazing. So yeah, K box says Amazon for the Romer top. Yes. And it's uh, R O E. It's R O E M E R T O P F. Romer top. And, uh, it, I, I'm sure mine came from Amazon. You can find different sizes. Be careful. They make really big ones. So make sure you get one that will fit in your oven. If you get too small of one, then you won't fit your roast in it. And that's, that's kind of a bummer too. And then the homegrown cooking live stream will show you what it looks like. And I probably say where, where you get that too. So that's, that's that. The weekly shopping report is next. And I did not see an update from the last update I gave. And if I were Joe, I would not have gone to the stores this weekend because it was complete mayhem from what I understand. I did not go. The feed store apparently was wrecked and all the store people getting ready for the snow. Uh, it's just, we know, we've known snow was coming for five or six days. And when Tactical and I heard about it, we divvied up how we were going to get stuff at the store that we thought we might need going in, you know, just making sure. And we're, we're, where that was, was making sure the animal feed was good. So he went to the feed store to get feed. And then we made sure gas was topped off because we don't want to go through that with January is usually the month we top off our gas cans. So other than that, we did not go to the store because we didn't need antifreeze devices or anything. We have, we have our systems in place for what they're going to be. And so if Joe was smart, he did not go to the store. <laughs> but I did not see a shopping update either. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that that's what happened. Our next segment is the frugality tip from Margo. And here's what Margo says. I'm going to read her exact words. Her words are, I went to the store and all that they had was a giant bag of carrots. So I made roasted root vegetables with carrots, butternut squash soup, and some uh, 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 butternut. Uh, sorry, we're going to back up. I, my intonation was wrong. So I made roasted root vegetables with carrots, butternut squash soup with carrots. I shredded some of this for some for salad. I cut some up to dip. And if there is some left, they will be chopped for soup. And all the tops and bottoms and peels were saved with onion tops and skins to go into a pot next week with a ham bone to become bone broth and pea soup. 
So that large bag of carrots that the girl next to me in the store turned her nose up at is getting used to the fullest in this house. And I'm saving money by using them in multiple ways. Also, I was hoping to have some left to ferment, but I don't. So don't be scared of the big bag of carrots. Just get creative. I, you know, I can never have too many carrots because they also last really well in cold storage, either in your fridge or in your root cellar. They will start growing in the root cellar and you can actually plant like the end of the carrot with the greens coming out and make more carrots, which is kind of a cool thing. But I love cooking with carrots in the winter. And I know it's not, it's not keto, but a few carrots here and there never hurt anybody. I threw two carrots in the, the pot roast today. So it's not in the Romer top, by the way. Yes. Letty says, Nicole talked about carrots becoming baby carrots in her kitchen our Friday. Yeah. So they, they actually take large carrots to make uh, baby carrots. Hold on a sec. I didn't want to do that on audio. I had to sneeze. I don't know where that went. I ended up, and it was only one. Usually I have two sneezes every time. I hear that's a hereditary thing, like the number of times you sneeze. Anyway, so they make baby carrots by use, I think they use, they cut them and use sand to make the skins come off and make them that, you know, like make them soft like that. They're not actually baby carrots. And that, thank you, K-Monk. And that is an interesting thing. So you can save money by buying the big bag of carrots, peeling it and cutting it into little carrot sticks like we used to have as kids. If you are a carrot, eat a fresh carrot eating, baby carrot eating person. Now I know the baby carrots are easier just to like glump out of the, out of the bag, but, and that's fine. Like do that if you need to do that. Don't, don't do it without guilt if you need to do that, but just know from a beating inflation standpoint, making your own carrot sticks is a way better deal. With that, it's time for the main topic of today's show and the reason you all came here, which is eliminating garbage in your life, your home, and your heart. So our focus this month, in case you haven't noticed, has been all about blossoming into 2024, despite the fact that we are at this, that the start of a new year is like, it's largely symbolic. It doesn't actually matter that it's January 1st and it's a new year. But a lot of people make changes in January of the new year because we have this benchmark and it's the new year, new me, let go of all the bad stuff. We should be letting go of the bad stuff anyway, as much as possible all the time. The past should not be controlling the future. And yet we let it do that. Truly, it does not matter to me if you blossom into 2024 with me right now or you blossom into October, or you blossomed into last October, it's the blossoming part that matters. So I'm setting that as the foundation, but I did realize that our energy as a network right now is all about the new word of the year, getting, you know, getting our side hustles going, starting our new businesses, deciding what we're going to be when we grow up, all of the fun stuff that we do at this time of year, losing that extra couple of pounds that got put on over Christmas. There's a lot of stuff going on like that resolutions I find are very fail, fail, prone to failure, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't try to change. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try to change. So in the last 10 days here, we have taken four trips to the Goodwill to donate stuff from my house. We have taken one trip to the auction house to sell stuff from my house. We have taken four trips to the garbage dump to throw things away from my house, five trips to the store to return things that were not used, that were brand new in the box. And I still had the receipts for that we purchased. Most of these were for construction projects that we've been doing since last October. And that, that is, uh, that yielded a good amount of money, but making sure they went back is something that ADHD Nicole is not always the best at, but they went back five trips. And I have posted a number of things on Facebook Marketplace for cheap because I want to get rid of it. It's still useful. I don't feel like hauling it to Goodwill and donating it. I would give it away for free. But if you give things away for free on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, you get more questions than, than help. But I have definitely I've equipped somebody with a fold out couch bed thing and a whole bunch of other stuff that they can use in their lives. Whew. My cash jar is looking really good right now because every time somebody pays for something, I stuff it in the cash jar and I use that to buy groceries and we're not buying groceries this month. So 
that means that that surplus at the end of the month goes into the swim spa fund, which is, which is some, a game I'm playing with myself. Beth Emily says, good job, Nicole. <laughs> That's where I started when COVID hit. That's right. And my home is less full than it was, which is awesome. There's still a long road ahead of purging this place though. And already with all of, with the first round of this basically behind me, I feel, I feel lighter and I feel like I could soar. It feels great. It feels great. I was walking around. The reason the show even came to be was a week and a half ago. I was walking outside deciding things that we'd sort of kept from my house that really should just be thrown away, what to throw away, what to get rid of, how to get rid of. I was just out there going, yeah, that can, I'm never going to use that. Like I've got a 24,000 BTU window AC unit. I was going to hold till spring and sell for people. I'm totally going to put that puppy up online in the middle of winter and not get optimal money out of it because I don't want it here. But it totally works. I'm just not going to use it anymore because of mini splits going in here, which will help with any hum remaining humidity issues in my house. And I don't need to keep that old thing around. But it works. Like somebody can have it or buy it. I'll put it for sale again. It's just, it, that's another one in the category of put it for sale on say, Facebook marketplace for cheap. So somebody will actually come and show up. It feels so much lighter in here. Even when it's cluttery, it feels lighter in here. And that's pretty cool. And I realized that it, it stuff has been in my way a lot for the last few years. It all comes down to garbage. What? are you doing with your garbage? Are you letting it pile up? Are you putting off, taking it off at, away? Are you not admitting that your garbage is garbage? Because that's what most of us do is we don't admit our garbage is garbage. At the same time, I'm reading the, the Peter Atia book, Outlive, which is just about using preventative measures to extend your life later in life, you know, things like eh, eating right and exercise and some, some medical interventions in some cases. I read 10 pages of that every day minimum, except for today I read nine, yesterday I read 13 because it kind of depends where the chapter breaks are. I like to get all the way to the end if I can so that I don't get confused about where I'm starting again. <laughs> that's just my weird, that's my weird, I'm sharing my weird with you today. Um, and something that struck me in his book is he was talking about what happens to our cells as we age and what happens to our cells over time is they get funky. They turn into garbage or parts of them turn into garbage. And when, when you fast as in don't eat, you stop having the things that you consume turned by your body into your energy. When you're talking about the metabolism, and the first thing your body does is it starts looking for garbage cells to use as building blocks for energy. So it takes something that could be hurting you and turns it into energy, which you need to function, which then serves to take the garbage out of your body, which is why intermittent fasting can be so helpful. And I, I don't remember the exact number of hours, but I think I'll be doing So my longest fast I've ever done was a little bit over 24 hours. I'm going to start building in a 48 hour fast once a month and, and see if I can do it, you know? Um, and hopefully that will help get rid of any inflammation that's remaining in my system because the inflammation are the unhappy cells. And if you get rid of the garbage, then you can soar. This is really a great topic for me in a year where my year, word of the year is hone, right? Because I've really been focused on hone. What, are, what can I do to hone what I'm doing? Do more with less. And the first question I've been asking myself this month in my journaling is what stands in my way? Right now, what stands in my way? How do I need to hone my focus to either get past it or get rid of it? And almost all the time, the answer is the thing that stands in my way needs to be kicked out the door. It shouldn't even be there. So on Thursday, we had our warmest day of the week. It was sunny. It was beautiful. And I needed to move firewood 
closer to the house because through all of that snow and then up under the tarp in the wood pile is something I can do, but that's not super fun. So I wanted to make sure I had seven days of firewood near the house. And in order to move the firewood, I took my wheelbarrow and I wheeled it around the stuff in my carport, around Tactical's truck, which is broken down in my driveway, went up the hill towards the, the wood pile and darned if there weren't two stupid cattle panels between me and that wood pile, which I also had to go around to then load one wheelbarrow full of wood and bring it down. And in a high wood consumption time, I'm actually looking at my wood fire, realizing my damper is probably all the way open and needs to be damped down, but it might be really warm in my house after this, po this podcast, unless tactical hears and comes and puts my damper down. But uh, Letty, feel free to text him on Telegram that if you're hearing this. Um, one wheelbarrow full will last me one day or a little more than one day. So I was like, okay, seven wheelbarrows. I have to basically go around, around, and around, load, around, around, and around, unload, around, around, and around. So then I was like, well, what can I do about this? Because more garbage is standing in my way. And the fact of the matter is the things that are keeping that garbage there is twofold. One, it's self-made. I'm not moving things back into my house unless I actually need them. Like today I went out and got my smaller cast iron skillets to cook two eggs and it's been in its box for three weeks. And at the end of the month, I'm going to then go through the boxes that are outside and decide, are these things I use seasonally or is this just kitchen stuff I don't use anymore? or household items I don't use anymore. So that's one around. The second around is the broken down truck. We need to do something none of us like to do, and that's some research because Tactical's keys fell out of his pocket somewhere, we think. Anyway, no keys to the truck. Need to figure out how to get the truck moving, whatever that takes. And that probably starts with a call to the dealer. And then the, the stupid cattle panels, I don't even know why they're there. And I didn't have the heart to move them like I could move them. But anywhere I dragged them was going to be in the way of something else. So this makes me want to get the barn built where I can put stupid stuff like that. So it's not blocking my access to my firewood. So I was grumbling to myself the whole time. And, and I realized... If there was less stuff on my property that's not serving the property, there would be places to put the things that are in my way and they would no longer be in my way. Of course, some of this could be solved by just putting places, some things somewhere, right? But really the problem is I moved into this property and there was a lot of garbage over the years. I've had different projects and changed focus and there's stuff left over from that that I don't even use. And here we are time to address the garbage. So even though I've taken all of these trips and gotten rid of all of the, most of it was from inside my house. It's not the homestead items outside the house. And there's more work to do because the thing about letting go of your garbage, eliminating your garbage is it's something you need to be vigilant about. It's something you need to be consistent with. It's something you need to ask yourself maybe once a month. Hey, what else is not serving me around here? And this can be a very hard habit for a prepper and a homesteader to do because there is nothing like I need a two by four and going out to the workshop and being like, I have the two by four that will work in this situation. So it's a, it's a balance between that could be useful in the future and that's not serving me right now. We have a tendency to keep the things that are not serving us right now, but that could be useful in the future too much. And I, I see it this way. When in my home, I cannot put the things away that I use. So it's orderly. And this is coming from a messy personality type who is probably ADHD. I do better when I know where stuff is. I can't put it away because other stuff is away. And the other stuff is away is stuff I haven't used. And that's why it's away. When I get to that point, it's time to take a critical look at that stuff. 
But what's so easy to let happen is just get another set of shelves or just let stuff sit out because, you know, that stuff might be useful someday. But does that serve you or does it get in the way of your future opportunities? I think in a year of hone, for me, it's time to do better than that. It is time to do better than I can't put it away because there's other stuff there. And I've made some pretty tough decisions this year <laughs> related to that for me emotionally. When we make sp space for what matters, that means we don't have space for the garbage. We don't have space for the garbage people in our lives. We don't have gar space for the garbage thoughts in our heads. We don't have space for the garbage physically in our house. And we don't have space for the garbage projects that we started and never finished, but we don't give up. So we're going to leave them around. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar at all? Remember that time I decided I wanted to take wine bottles and cut them and make vases and sell the vases. And I bought the little tool where you can, um, you can cut the glass and break it by heating it. It works great. I made one. I have made zero since then. I bought that stupid tool a decade ago. It is sitting in a box. That's one of the things that's actually physically in my office right now still that's pushed over to the wall. I'm not painting. It's like literally in my office right now. And I'm confident I'm never going to use it again for a couple of reasons. One, I don't drink that much wine anymore. So I don't have a lot of wine bottles around to oh, like, okay, so then I have all these wine bottle vases. What do I do with them? What do I do with them? doesn't make sense. <laughs> so whew, that's the thing. It's time to do better. For me, it's time to do better all the time. And making space for what matters in my life is of paramount importance to me at this time. So as I journey through my household purge, which is taking weeks and will probably take months, even though I'm hitting it pretty hard, I realize that in the same way that exercise helps you improve your mental health, this process of removing the physical roadblocks, the physical barriers around me is helping me work through my mental and emotional garbage. And it's helping me better understand what projects and activities really matter to me, either financially or emotionally, like things I actually like doing and should be kept around rather than keeping the things that are here or the projects that are here or the mental baggage that is here that's comfortable. I've just gotten comfortable with it. If it's not serving me, it's time to go. And one could conclude that cutting the garbage from your life is as important as building the life you choose. Because when you're building the life you choose, you're choosing not to do other things. But if you bring other things forward with you that you would rather not be doing, then you end up not building the life you choose. And I sort of got into that trap when I was running that nonprofit, the job I did before I, I, I come to y'all over the internet here, right? Like I started something based on passion and mission and I loved what we were doing. What I did not love doing was running a nonprofit organization and where my focus needed to be for that to be successful in the long run was on the organization and not on the, on the, on the actual hands on the ground mission. And now I do every day, basically the same mission that nonprofit did in a different way. I do a totally different way but it's the same motivation. It's basically the same thing. And I get to do the fun part. I love to do the fun part. So I think that cutting the garbage from your life, cutting the garbage people from your life, cutting the garbage mental effort from your life and cutting the garbage projects from your life. It's how you build the life you choose on your terms. Because if you leave the garbage around, it gets in the way. So let's talk about the garbage. And, you know, I told Brian from the Lots Project that I was a little bit jealous of him. Like, not jealous in a bad way, or envy might be the better word. Because he and his wife got rid of most of their stuff and moved into a camper. And they, they made all of those decisions in one go fairly quickly. 
and and then all that garbage was out of their life. And it's going to take me months because I still have the homestead and I'm still doing all these things in order to do these things. I need the things to do the things. But boy, I'll tell you what, I'd rather have one really nice shovel, Strong Roots Resources, than a bunch of crappy shovels around. And I have the shovel that Carrie uses because it works great. And I used his and I was like, man, I'm going to throw away my four other shovels and I'm going to get one of these. Makes a huge difference. I'd rather have one really awesome coffee cup than 90 coffee cups. Although I probably do have 90 coffee cups around here. Maybe not 90. That'll be a hard one. Like I should totally film the, the sorting of the coffee mugs of the coffee drinking lady. That'll be fun. So when we take a deep dive into garbage, I thought about just the different kinds of garbage that is in the, in our lives, right? Physical garbage is easiest. So I say start there. Start with your physical garbage. Start with your clutter. Start with the things that you put aside and say, this might be useful one day. Like this chipped coffee mug right here that I can't drink out of. Ooh, that made noise. See, there's a chip right there. I can't serve anything in that. It's a pen holder for me right now. Do I really need to keep that though? Because I have this unchipped coffee mug that looks just like it that I can drink coffee out of that I can serve coffee in. Things that are useful one day are a barrier today. You know that time that you donated the thing to Goodwill or Salvation Army or wherever you bring your things? And then you needed that thing four months later. You remember that happening to you? And you're like, now I got to buy a new one of those. And oh, it costs money. That pain of that one experience is why you don't get rid of your physical garbage. And something I've realized about that is that just happens in life. It just happens. More often than not, when you get rid of your physical garbage, that does not happen. So when you get rid of a hundred things, maybe one thing is that thing that comes back four months later and you end up indeed using it. In fact, I was going to get rid of my Romer top as part of this purge. And then I had an experience where I was like, boy, I really need to get this roast cooked quickly and I don't have a pressure cooker, which would do it. I'm going to try the Roper, Romer top. And in three hours, I had a roast that was delicious and fall apart pot roast. And I decided to keep the Romer top. And I would have been, I'm not even sure I would have known had I gotten rid of the Romer top because it wouldn't have been an option. But I just sort of looked up different lengths of time for cooking and having discovered that and having rediscovered all of the great things you can do with it, I think it's a really good winter cooking thing. I may, I, I wouldn't use it in the summer because you got to run the oven and I'm not going to run the oven in my house and the air conditioning if I can avoid it. But man, it's a great winter cooking thing and it does a better job than my Dutch oven. Well, now the Dutch oven's up for debate, except for I use the Dutch oven on the wood stove to make stew. So we'll probably keep both of those things. But that one thing out of a hundred that you end up rebuying, does that really cost you more money than all of the money and time wasted maintaining the other 99 items that you'll never use that are actually keeping you from moving forward? That change in perspective is one of the hardest ones to make. And I think that piece in the prepper's heart is something you need to kill. It actually relates to the poverty mindset to hang on to things too much. Now, of course, things that are actually serving you, you should hang on to. But I think when we are hanging on to things that hold us back because we're afraid we won't be able to buy it when we need it, that's there's a poverty mindset issue in there. You, see, you follow me? So the other thing that my sister told me this year or last year that really resonated me with me is that the cheapest storage unit that you can buy is Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. And when she said that, I was like, my mind blown because she's right. I have a stupid KitchenAid stand mixer that takes, it's a pro. It's a really good one. Takes up lots of room. Sells for about $200 on Facebook Marketplace. Also buys for about $200 on Facebook Marketplace. So if I can get $200 for it, and then buy it for $200, that's great. And if I can only get $100 for it and then buy it for $200 when I need it for the one week a year I need it, 
I spent a hundred dollars on the stand mixer. Then I'm going to decide if I need that stand mixer for the hundred dollars. I actually don't think I need it at all. I can hand knead bread if I ever make bread. I can whip cream. How do I whip cream? Ah, I got a blender. I can whip cream. I actually have the little egg beater thing with the cranky arm. I like to use that for beating eggs and for making whipped cream. I do that more than bring out the stand mixer because it's heavy. The only time I have to whip cream is when I have to whip a lot of cream. And that is a really rare occurrence at this point because I don't really eat desserts anymore. You see where I'm going with this? So yes, one day I'll be like, man, I wish I had that stand mixer to make these cookies for Christmas I'm giving away as gifts. But is, you know, is it worth it? Or can I just put it in the storage unit that is Craigslist and flea markets and Facebook marketplace and anywhere else where you can buy stuff? The fact of the matter is everything you keep in your life, whether it be the cells in your body, the crap in your heart and mind, the people who are pulling you down or the stuff in your life requires maintenance. And that requires time. And time is your most precious resource. Also, degeneration happens. In Tennessee, we have a lot of humidity here in the summer. And I keep my tools in a, a barn-like structure. And tools that move when exposed to humidity and not moved on a regular basis develop rust. And they have a tendency to stop moving. And I have completely obliterated a tile saw in this way in five years by not using it for five years. Well, it turns out I don't tile every year. So mold and degeneration are things that happen to the things you keep around if you don't use the things you keep around. And that's just another reason to not keep those things around. I have started getting rid of perfectly good tools because they're perfectly good and I can auction them. That's why we went to the auction house, by the way, because we don't use them. A tile saw being a key example of that. Yes, I've done two tile jobs in the last 12 months. I have used Nighthawk's tile saw both times. The second time I used it, he had stored it and a rat got in there and ate hoses and cords and we had to like fix it to get it to you to work. I sold my tile saw because it was nicer. And if his gets, you know, like I'm not sure it's, it's going to make it another year in that storage container. So I'll rent one at Lowe's or Home Depot. I, I mean, shoot, it costs, you know, a little bit less than buying it. But, you know, my justification's always been, I'll just pay more and then I'll have it. But I'm not a tile contractor. Like, why do I need that? I do use my impact driver. I do need that, right? There are ones that I need, but stuff that I'm going to use every five years or so. In Tennessee, it just doesn't maintain well unless you have a, a way to store it that's uh, climate controlled and then you're spending money on maintenance. So that's about like get ruthless about the physical things that you're keeping. Like I'm looking at my desk right now. This is typical, right? Um, for those on the audio, I'm holding up a plant pot that looks like a diaper and it has little kitties on it. And I keep it because... This was a, a baby gift to me when I was born from my, I think from my godparents. And it's sentimental. So let's talk about sentimental garbage. Am I calling that garbage right now? No. But I'll tell you something that is the garbage in my life in my way right now. It's a beautiful oak, antique, dining room table that I think is six feet long and it becomes eight or 10 feet long when the leaves come out. It weighs about 40,000 tons, comes with six chairs, one of which is kind of broken and needs to be fixed. I have been eating at that table since I was born. It's, and I inherited it from my parents. It has only ever fit in one house I lived in. And that was my house in Portland, Oregon that had a formal dining room. And it is perfect for a formal dining room. I've already sold the buffet. I still have the table. The longer I have the table, the less good condition it's in. I do not have room in my 1,200 square foot home for a table of that size. And if I have a large event here, I can bring in fold-out tables into my living room and we can eat at those like for Thanksgiving or whatever. So it's not serving me. It's sentimental garbage. The reason it's still here is an emotional connection to that table. And I realized 
that it's time to let get let go of my sentimental garbage because I have parents. I have two parents. My parents are divorced and remarried. So that's two households worth of stuff. I have two sets of grandparents. That's four households worth of stuff. And my parents had two children and my sister had two children and I have no children. So that's four households worth of stuff to go into generations below it as people downsize or die. And we're not growing as a family. So it's not like one, one cup from grandma's house can go to me and one cup can go to my, I mean, I have four cousins, so that was actually helpful, right? All of her dishes got divided up among us, among us, but four households worth of stuff is won't fit in a 1200 square foot home. So we have to have a way to work through the sentimental stuff, the sentimental garbage that's in our lives. And that means making crucial decisions about diaper pots. Do I really want this diaper pot or do I want a picture of this diaper pot that I store digitally as a memory? And do I want to pass the diaper pot on to somebody else? Do I want to do that? I want to get rid of my dining room table. And this is something with sentimental garbage that comes up. We think it's worth more than it is. I think my dining room table is worth $2,000 because it's a big oak dining room table. The world thinks my dining room table is worth $0 based on my experience trying to sell it. However, for tax purposes, if I look at other antique dining room tables of that kind, they're about $2,000. However, I'm not an antique dealer and I don't want to sit around with this table in my store until it finds the right person. So what I can do with that table is donate it, take the tax write-off for the donation, for the charitable contribution, and then have pictures of that table and memories of that table and move, move on with my life so that it's not taking up my whole living room so that I can actually use my living room as a living room instead of as a place where I put the dining room table. It's kind of like having a baby grand piano, right? It's just not worth, have I tried consignment? There's not a consignment option that I've found that's worthwhile. I can get a better write-off for that table at this point. Like I have to sell it for $500 or more or else I'll get a better tax write-off. And I just decided that less of my time is worth donating it. Unless somebody hearing this suddenly wants to buy that table, and you probably don't, because then you have a big table to fit into your life, right? It just, it wasn't meant to be. And so coming, coming to terms with getting rid of that sentimental garbage can be the hardest one. It can be even harder than it might be worthwhile someday. The year of cleaning out a dead parent's home is something none of us want to pass on to our children. And I have relatives in this situation right now where their parent died, left a house, you know, 2,500 square foot home full of like crammed full of stuff. And guess what? They now have to clean out all that stuff. Contrast that with my grandma who had some really good lessons to teach me over the years. My grandma died after I started this podcast and it was hard. It's it's she was a hard one to use because she was such a positive influence in my life. And she died living in a quad in a single bedroom in that quad. And over her retirement years and as she became elderly, she went from, you know, homestead style house to like smaller home with a nice garden to living in a trailer park in like a single wide sort of situation with a little yard to living in an apartment with her twin sister to living in a single room. And every one of those moves, she packaged stuff and gave it away or got rid of stuff or had a garage sale. She got rid of the garbage. So she wasn't just moving all of this stuff or maintaining a storage unit. And Cleaning out her room took us less than an hour to move her stuff. And then what happened after she died is I got snowed in at my dad's house and my stepmom was in the hospital. So dad was down the hill in the hospital and I was up at the house. And 
uh, I went through the four boxes of her stuff and got to look at all these memories. And she had written little notes on things like who she wanted to go for and what it was and what its history was. That's why the teapot I have, I know was my great grandma's teapot because my grandma wrote a note on it. Transitioning that way, wouldn't you rather be the person who transitions that way than leaves your children with a year of having to sort out a 2,500 square home full of crap? Eliminate the garbage, guys. Even the sentimental garbage. Find a way to keep the things you truly love and keep the things that truly serve you that are sentimental and let the other stuff go. Let the other stuff go. Which brings us to another one. The mental garbage. The mental garbage is why I developed my three things. Because I am prone to walking on journeys in my brain. And my three things really helps me hone down a focus. So that I get the most important things done. Not every day. But most days. That is 100% why that happened for me. But the other part of mental garbage are the doubts, the fears, the panic, the sleep mist, right? The excuses, the jealousy of the bad kind, being unkind to people, all the symptoms of not feeling good enough, all the symptoms of not being okay with my way or the highway. All of the symptoms of not feeling like you can be yourself because other people won't accept you as you are. I think everybody has that, by the way. Even the people who hide it best have moments. But the people who do best through that are the people who let the baggage go. Who let the anger that they hold for other people who have wronged them go. I had a hard lesson on that one because um, I was working in the nonprofit world and somebody said, I, like, I wrote a grant. They were working on the project with me. They were instrumental to executing the grant and they ghosted me. And I had to figure out how to get that done. And I basically lost money because I had to pay more than what we'd agreed on to get somebody else to execute on that project. And I held a grudge against that person for years. I was so mad. And then one day, I, I mean, I, it, it did not serve me to do that, right? That mental garbage got in the way and kept like that defensiveness kept me from moving forward to my potential. And one day I saw that person somewhere and they walked up and they knew that I wasn't happy with what had happened. But they walked up to me and as they were walking up, I thought, you know what, what happens right now if I smile and say hello and just talk and let it go? And so I did that and I could see the relief on this person's face like, okay, good. We're not going to have this like uncomfortable thing between us anymore. And we don't to this day. They don't, we don't to this day, you know, John Willis often says, People don't even know you're mad at them most of the time when you're mad at them. You're only hurting yourself with that. Don't sacrifice, sacrifice yourself to grudges. Don't do it. Not worth it. You've got, you've got your whole life to build. That's a much better focus for you. But it requires eliminating the mental garbage. And that doesn't mean don't stand up for yourself, by the way. There's, that's different. It's very different. I am prone to emotion eating at night in particular. So tactical leaves, all of a sudden I'm hungry again. I'm not hungry. I just ate dinner. I'm not hungry at all. But it's been in my life for a long time. And I've made a lot of positive changes in my life over the last five years. And a lot of you have been here on this journey with me. And it has required getting rid of some garbage. But something that I've never addressed mentally is the emotion eating. Sometimes I have it under control better than other times. But boy, if things get tense, I'm like straight for the chocolate or straight for the, you know, it's not popcorn in the middle of the night anymore, but whatever. Almost every time I'm hungry at midnight, I'm not actually hungry. I'm emotionally hungry. I'm missing something. I'm trying to get an endorphin rush to, to get myself over a hump. And I don't even know why I emotion eat, guys. 
I just know that I'm prone to it and I have never been willing to truly address it, but it's the garbage that stands in my way. So this year I went beyond complaining about it and took steps to deal with it. And what I have done to deal with it is come up with substitutes first. So peppermint tea, emotion eating is fine. <laughs> I know it's not as good. Once a week, hot cocoa is fine. Hot cocoa is way better than two chocolate bars or whatever. I also currently don't allow myself to have things in my house that aren't serving me. And one of the things that doesn't serve me in my house are chocolate bars because I will eat them. So Tactical keeps my chocolate bars for me. None of this is healthy. And this means that I have mental garbage to get rid of. And I decided this year I'm ready to go back to the psychiatrist who helped me deal with the grief that I was feeling and other um, issues when Mark and I separated and actually address the emotion eating issue. I think I had to go through the dramatic lifestyle changes that I have gone through in the last five years in order to even be ready to address this garbage. But this is the year of home and emotion eating is not serving me. It just makes me feel bad the next day if I do it. And it makes me feel mentally bad and physically bad. Like it's a double-edged sword. And I'm not going to say that a piece or two of chocolate is the problem. It's lots of chocolate that's the problem. And it's using it as a crutch instead of I would like to enjoy a piece of chocolate right now, much like an alcoholic can't stop drinking. That's how I am with certain foods. And it always happens at night. Uh, the other mental garbage that people like me face is scheduling in downtime to take care of the mental garbage. We are afraid when we are not active that we will not build success in our lives. But that's not necessarily true. And something I've learned in the last, like really learned in the last four or five weeks is every, as I make more and more space is better and better things are already happening because I made space. And some of that space was just space to think things through so I could make a better decision while doing something else, you know, usually while moving firewood or whatever. Um, so that's mental garbage. And there's a lot of people who have, more difficult past experiences that have led to mental issues. And all I can say is maybe you need to put more focus there than on your clutter right now, or maybe you need to start with the clutter, but dealing with your mental garbage is what's, I mean, your mental garbage is what's holding you back, no matter how bad your past was. And I know some of you have had way worse pasts than mine and have it's work. It's work to get through that. I understand. But once you get past that hurdle, man, it's no longer there. It's like my taxes. Once they're done, it's like a huge freeing experience for me. I'm like, thank you. No more paperwork for another year. I am in the middle of that garbage right now too. Uh, so the next one is your people garbage. You should do this annually. You should write down the 20 people you interact with most. This is going to include friends, family members, people at your church, people at work, probably some of us on the internet. And write it down and you put a plus next to the ones who, after you talk to them, you feel happy and better. A minus next to the ones where when you talk to them, you go, oh, like Eeyore. And a zero next to the ones who there's no change. And everybody who has a minus next to them, you need to assess if that's a temporary minus. Like, hey, they just lost their parents and it's a real problem talking to them because they're downers right now. Or if they are energy vampires, as Letty is saying into the, uh, into the thing. And if they are energy vampires, you need to, it's garbage. That's the garbage. Get rid of the garbage. Don't let the garbage in and get rid of the garbage that is there now. And you might be related to that person. And then you need to make some hard decisions about how you insulate yourself from their garbage. Insulate the, yourself from their impact. Eliminating family garbage is the hardest to do. Sometimes people do change behavior though, guys. Other times you need to shut them out of your life completely. Other times you can just, you just, <laughs> that word, whenever I say just, it means it's hard. <laughs> 
So that means you can just put in some boundaries that protect you. <laughs> and talk to your friends about how to do that if you need help. But the more you are around the people who lift you up, the higher you go. And the more you're around the people who tear you down, the lower you are. Cut the people crap out of your life. Cut it out. And I say this as somebody who has an extended family vampire that I have had to cut out of my life. It's somebody who I'm like by blood related to who is going through an addiction problem and that addiction problem is leading to them being a problem in my life if I interact with them. And I say this as having been right by tactical side through his addiction problem. He was not tearing me down during that. It was a hard problem for him, but he was addressing his problem. They're not there yet. I can't help them. Therefore, I have to have boundaries. And those boundaries are related to time. No time. There is no time for that. That may change if that person decides to address their, their addiction problem. But right now, they're not ready. Right now, they're not ready. And this brings us to the last. And for me, this is the most difficult. I've probably already said one of these other ones, the most difficult, and it was sentimental garbage. But no, this one, I'm a doer. Do it. Just do it. Just do it. Project garbage. How many of you have that scarf you started knitting and never finished left to finish? How many of you started making a smokehouse once and never finished that? How many of you remodeled your bathroom and didn't put the window trim in yet? How many of you every year are the person who coordinates your church's fundraising fundraiser and you're really good at it and you hate doing it? Yeah, that's, that's what I call project garbage. It's hard for doers to let things go. And if a project stands in your way of doing something that's a higher and better use of your time, in my case, clerical things is high on that list, or saying yes to everything when you really shouldn't, those things stand in your way of doing the things you love. Those things stand in your way of doing things well that you're doing poorly because you don't have time because you're spending it doing things that you don't love, that don't serve you. And I can say this, like having done my choir's fundraiser for many years, Due to the family illness, I was not involved in that fundraiser at all. They still raised money. I did not have to be there. And it actually felt really great in October not to be doing that for me. That's project garbage. Does that mean I'll never help with the choir fundraiser again? No, but other people are running it and they're doing a good job. Why do I need to be there? That's a mantle that can pass around. And it's so easy to just be stuck in the habit of the projects you do every year that you lose sight of what the projects bring you. Sounds selfish, doesn't it? And it is, and it should be because you should be cutting your project garbage. What I'm doing this year is I'm starting with no every time a new opportunity comes up. Because I say yes a lot. So now it's no. It's no until I think about it. How can I make this serve me? Is it serving me? Do I even like doing it? How much time is it going to take? Am I going to make money at this? Because cash flow doesn't get better if you take jobs that don't make you money. Hard truth. And if I'm never going to finish knitting that scarf, maybe it's time to hand it on to somebody else or just pull the yarn out and keep it for making yarn mazes in my living room when my nieces come over and visit. Like, I don't know. But there's no reason to keep the project around just because you started it and you have to finish it. You don't have to finish it. You can decide that doesn't serve you anymore and you can move on to the things that do serve you. I mean... How many times do we do things because we're supposed to? What does that even mean? Oh, Letty, you're clickbaiting about SRF, aren't you? <laughs> you are doing SRF, by gum. 
anyway, well, he was like, is this the time I tell Nicole I'm not doing SRF stuff? <laughs> so just because you're good at something doesn't mean you should be doing it. Other people are good at it too. If the project doesn't serve your life and doesn't serve the, the life you want to build, stop doing it. Sometimes it means stop doing it after you live up to your commitments, which is what I did with my nonprofit, right? I was like, these are my commitments. This is what I'm doing. Once this is done, unless somebody else comes and takes over, this nonprofit is closing, go. And the nonprofit closed. So I guess it wasn't that important of a nonprofit. Nobody else was passionate about it like I was. So that's my thought on week two of January about falling forward into prosperity into and creating creating your opportunities into 2024 so you can thrive because we all want to flourish but it's all about the garbage man i just spoke with a lady named aurora who's who i met at exit and build land summit and she's been developing an off-grid homestead in texas since the day I met her and she was super excited when she talked. I, I can't remember why she reached out. She reached out to send me some information based on something I talked about online. And I asked her how she was doing. She was like, listed all this stuff they accomplished last year. And she's like, and the bio digesters in. And so that now we can take food scraps and we can turn it into cooking gas. And I was like, great. I'm so glad you have one of those. I have questions because I've been like attracted to that conceptually but I hear critiques about it for people who live in cold climates. And she said, what are the critiques? And I said, it does not make enough gas to cook your food. And she said, I'm in Texas where it's warm and it doesn't make enough gas to cook my food. But every few days it does. And I cook my food with that gas every few days. And that's good enough for me because I'm turning my garbage into something positive. And I was like, wow, that's great. She's right. When you eliminate the garbage, you can either throw it away or you can make it give you something that you do want. I do that in the form of feeding my chickens. So what she does with her scraps, she cooks with. What I do with my scraps, I get eggs out of, right? This is called replacing your garbage function. It's like your, your, your function stacking. I eliminate the garbage, I get the thing. So her garbage is being eliminated. It's turned into positive forward momentum in a very tangible way. And as she tells stories about it on her off-grid homestead with her content creation business, guess what? People are super interested and that helps her on, in a professional way, way. She's managing her garbage well and it shows. So my question to you is, are you managing your garbage well? If not, start with one thing, one of those categories. Add it to your My Three Things list. Let's do this together. Let's bust through the garbage that we have in our lives to create space for opportunities because there are so many opportunities for us every single day, no matter what's going on. Even if there is six inches of snow or 10 inches of snow outside your window in Tennessee and you can't go anywhere. What are you doing with your garbage? Let me know. If you like the show and want to support the work we do here, you can do it in two ways. One, Get your coffee at hollerroast.com. Two, consider becoming a member. Our membership webinar next month will be with Sue Zoldak. It's a follow-up to the show we did in October where we're collecting questions in advance and she's going to address those marketing questions. So you definitely want to get in on that. With that, guys, go out and make it a great week.